This session is the Gene Therapy Clinical Trial Updates. I'm Steve Rose. Welcome to the science session on clinical gene therapy updates. The presentation will last approximately 45 minutes, and the remaining 15 minutes of the session will be reserved for questions from the audience. Please note that the session is being audio recorded. If you're using an assisted listening device, please turn to channel one. I don't see the sign, sorry. And don't forget to silence your cell phone. The speakers for this session are Dr. Shannon Boy, Michael Michelotti's, and we have hijacked Mark Panisi from Oregon Health and Sciences Center to come up and join us since Oregon is a major participant in a number of the trials. Dr. Boy is an assistant professor at the University of Florida's Department of Ophthalmology. Her lab is currently focused on developing a treatment for Labor's congenital amaurosis, optimizing AAV vectors to target genes and photoreceptors, and developing dual AAV vector platforms for the treatment of ocular diseases associated with mutations in larger genes. Dr. Michelotti's is a consultant ophthalmologist at Moorfields Eye Hospital in the departments of medical retina, inherited eye disease, and pediatric ophthalmology. He is also a Department of Health funded clinical senior lecturer at the University College London Institute of Ophthalmology. He's actively involved in human studies investigating novel and established therapies as a principal investigator in six ongoing clinical trials. Dr. Mark Panisi is assistant professor at Oregon Health and Sciences University Department of Ophthalmology, works with Dick Welliber and others at Oregon Health and Sciences, is involved in multiple clinical studies, including the VPA study from the Foundation Fighting Blindness and the ProgStar study of, oh, not ProgStar, excuse me. Uh, never mind. So, gene therapy, yes. Well, we have, we'll get to that. So, um, before we begin, I'd like to remind everybody to please complete the evaluation form in your conference bag. Your feedback is key to implementing new ideas and improving visions year after year. You can turn in the completed forms at the registration desk. With that, I will let the speakers do their thing. I never knew this would be such a big room I'd be speaking. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you to Steve and to the foundation for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I am the very grateful recipient of an Individual Investigator Award from the Foundation Fighting Blindness, and it's really been the first grant that I've received as an independent investigator to get my research up off the ground and running. Um, so I'm very grateful to all of you and to the Foundation. Um, so this is an exciting topic we're going to be talking about today, and I also have to mention that the Foundation has been involved in supporting every single one of the clinical trials that we'll be updating you on today. Uh, so the game plan is to divide and conquer. Uh, Dr. Michelades and myself will be um, discussing six ongoing clinical trials. And I wanted to get started with the one that really is the platform from which all other clinical trials has sprung. And that, of course, is labor congenital amaurosis type 2. Um, you all have likely heard a lot about LCA2 and the ongoing clinical trial for this disease. But I thought it would be a good idea to um, go back a little bit and give you some background on the disease take you through the proof of concept studies that were done to address gene replacement for this disease and then describe what the, um, the results of the clinical trials have been thus far. So LCA2 is a very rare disease. It affects approximately one in one million live births and it's associated with mutations in the gene RPE65. This gene normally produces a protein called RPE65 which is expressed in the retinal pigment epithelium, which is an epithelial cell layer adjacent to the photoreceptor cells in the retina. Now what RP65 normally does is it produces something called a chromophore, and it delivers that chromophore to the photoreceptor cells. 
And photoreceptor cells need that chromophore in order to process light as vision. So when you have a mutation in RPE65, and the RPE can't provide chromophore to the photoreceptors, then eventually those cells will start to lack function, and eventually they can degenerate. So that's the basis of, of the disease. Now this has been a wonderful test case for uh, gene therapy, because as luck would have it, there are many animal models, many appropriate animal models with which to develop a gene therapy in. Um, and the definition, as I mentioned yesterday, of an appropriate animal model is one that faithfully mimics the human condition. So in the case of LCA2, what you would need would be a mouse or a dog model that would lack retinal function and also um, exhibit some signs of retinal degeneration and perhaps even a lack of visually guided behavior. So there's been a lot of work done on these animal models of LCA2. And initial work, as you've heard a lot about over the course of the conference, was done in the dog model, um, Lancelot being the most famous of all of the treated dogs. So what they found in the dog model of this disease was that they could deliver a healthy copy of RPE65 to this dog via the subretinal space with an AAV vector, so an adeno-associated virus vector. And what they found after subretinal injection of this vector in the dog model was that they were able to restore retinal function, which was assessed with a test called electroretinogram, or ERG. They also found that it was capable of preserving the photoreceptor cell, so another very exciting result. Uh, most exciting, however, was the fact that the treatment restored visually guided behavior to this dog model. And what that means to us as scientists, it's, it's really cool on a neuroscience level because what you're doing is you're um, injecting a drug into the eye and then you're finding that the brain was able to accommodate to that injection in the eye. So the brain learned something from what you put in the eye. Okay, so that was all very exciting work done in the dog. And importantly, um, Lancelot passed away one or two years ago, I wanna say. Um, and what they found was that his therapeutic effects were persistent over his lifetime. So that's really exciting for gene therapy, that it was persistent. So after all of this work went on in the dog model of the disease, a lot of work got started up in the mouse models of the disease. Um, and we used these mouse models to determine things like what effects the therapy had on rod photoreceptors versus cone photoreceptors. We used the mice to determine what window of therapy would look like. In other words, how late can we deliver the vector and still achieve those therapeutic effects. So a lot was done in the mice, but the take home message was the same, and that's that there was restoration of retinal function, restoration of visually guided behavior, and preservation of photoreceptors as a result of this treatment. So at this point, we have this mountain of proof of concept data showing us that an, a subretinal injection of AAV carrying a normal copy of RPE65 is capable of providing uh, therapeutic benefits to these animal models, restoring their vision. So that's when everybody got together and decided that we need to get this into patients. So before that could be done, however, we needed to do safety studies. So it's, it's one thing to show efficacy, but we need to really pin down what the safest dose will be to put in the patient. So at that point, the safety studies were initiated, and what we did was we used rats, mice, and monkeys, or non-human primates, and we delivered different doses of the vector, uh, low dose, medium dose, and high dose. And those studies were done in order to determine what the safest dose would be to put in the patients. And after that was concluded, um, all of this led to the initiation of multiple phase one slash two gene therapy clinical trials in human. And those happened at three different places, one at CHOPS, one in the UK, and one as a collaboration between the University of Florida and the University of Pennsylvania. Where we are right now, um, there have been actually four now independent trials um, that have been published, the results of which have been published. And the longest follow-up of these patients has been three years. Those three-year-long follow-ups have been done by two groups. And so what I want to tell you all is that um, among these clinical trials, there were some slight differences in design. Um, for instance, where exactly the vector was placed in the patient, the method of anesthesia in the patient, um, the slightly different dose perhaps was delivered to the patient, all kind of small differences in the clinical trial design. But among them, all of the results were generally the same. And so for now, I'm just gonna go um, for the next few minutes talk about some of the results that were seen in these patients. Excitingly, within days of treatment, these patients exhibited robust improvements in the sensitivity of their photoreceptor cells. That sounds a little murky. Um, what that means is, is that uh, 
um, the, the scientists would ask the patients, look at and tell me if you can see these dim lights or these bright lights. And before treatment, the patient couldn't see the dim light. After treatment, all of a sudden, the patient could see the dim light. So it was a way of showing that their photoreceptors had gained a lot of sensitivity. And importantly, these sensitivity improvements were restricted to the area where the vector was placed in the eye. Um, for those of you that aren't quite sure surgically how this process happens, when you give a gene therapy vector and you put it in the subretinal space, you're not creating a bleb that covers the entire retina. You're creating a little bleb in a portion of the retina. So um, the doctors were actually able to look to see if these sensitivity improvements had um, happened within the region where the vector was placed or outside of it. And in fact, the sensitivity improvements were restricted to the area where the vector was placed, not surprisingly. In terms of visual acuity, which everyone knows is the gold standard outcome measure, um, you can think of it as lines of vision on a chart where you're looking at the, the very high contrast black letters. Um, some, one of the trials reported a significant improvement in visual acuity in their patients, while the other two did not. In the two that did not, some of the patients had increases, but collectively there wasn't a significant improvement among the whole um, group of patients. Uh, the doctors also conducted ERG tests, um, and the specific kind they used was called a full field ERG. So when you do a full field electroretinogram, you're looking at the responses that are emanating from the entire retina. So if you'll remember, I said that when they treat these patients, they place the bleb in a very discrete area of the retina. So they were not able to see improvements in full field ERG responses, but that's likely because the place that the, or the small area that the vector was placed was not contributing enough signal for it to be picked up by this full field ERG. So again, not a very surprising result. In some of the patients, there was a reduction in nystagmus noted, meaning the roving eye movements calmed down. An anecdotal result was that some patients noticed noticeably increased brightness when they awoke in a darkened room. So again, an indicator that their photoreceptors had gained sensitivity. In one trial, there was a report that the pupillary light reflex improved. Um, for those of you that aren't visually impaired, you know that if you're in a movie theater and you walk outside into the bright sunlight, your pupils constrict. And that's an adaptive mechanism that prevents your retina from being exposed to too much bright light. Um, so the untreated patients have very abnormal pupillary light reflexes, but after treatment with the gene therapy vector, these light reflexes actually improved. And then um, my personal favorite, from a neuroscience standpoint, is the result that was achieved one year after treatment. Um, and this was noted in one patient um, that said that for the first time since treatment, which again was a year prior, she could see the digital clock in her family vehicle for the first time. And so what this, um, after some further investigation, they realized that for the first time, this patient started to fixate with the area of the retina that had been treated with the gene therapy vector. And it took one full year for the brain to accommodate to the change that was made to the eye. So this tells us a lot about the fact that our brains are plastic. There's plasticity. We can accommodate to changes, including um, those that are achieved with gene therapy. So it was a very exciting result. Um, since then, it's been reported that administration of vector to the second eye is also safe and effective, and this is being done by Gene Bennett's group. Okay, where we are right now with LCA2. We are currently in phase three cl clinical trials for treatment of this disease, and these trials are being conducted at CHOPS and at the University of Iowa. And I've talked briefly with some of the investigators involved in that trial, and I can tell you that they are treating patients already, and that the results are good, and that the vector, um, up, up till this point at least, appears to be very um, safe and well tolerated, so similar um, to the previous results. Um, and what I just wanted to cover very briefly is that the, the trial design for this phase three trial is slightly different than what was used in the past. Um, in this trial, they are doing bilateral treatment, meaning that the patient comes in and receives subretinal injection of vector, and then within a week or so later, they receive an injection in the other eye. So this is um, what sets it apart, really, from the, the trials before it. Um, and I should mention, too, that for every two patients that do receive the gene therapy vector, one patient is um, put into a control group. The reason for that is because they want to follow the patients for at least one year to collect some more natural history data on them. So that is where we're at with LCA2. Does anyone have anything to add? You guys good? Okay.
All right, so now we're gonna move into the gene therapy trial for Usher's 1B. Okay, Usher syndrome is a clinically and genetically heterogeneous group of autosomal recessive disorders. That means you need to inherit one bad gene from mom, one bad gene from dad. They need to come together for you to present with the disease. Um, what I mean by genetically heterogeneous is that a number of different genes have been found to be associated with formation of one type of Usher syndrome or the other. It's clinically heterogeneous in that if a patient has a mutation in gene A, they might present in the clinic very differently than a patient that has a mutation in gene B. But taken together, all forms of Usher syndrome account for the most frequent cause of combined deafness and blindness worldwide. Usher syndrome can be divided into three different subtypes, and these subtypes vary um, depending on the onset and the extent of hearing loss and retinitis pigmentosa, or photoreceptor degeneration. And of those three subtypes, USH1 is the most severe. Um, these patients are born profoundly deaf, and they lose vision during childhood. Right now, we know that there are five genes associated with formation with USH1, and among them, myosin 7A accounts for 60% of all cases. So myosin 7A, mutations in myosin 7A, account for the most frequent cause of the most severe form of Usher syndrome. Okay, uh, what does myosin 7A do? Myosin 7A is one of these proteins that we know some about, but we don't know everything about. Um, so I'm gonna tell you what we do know. We know that this protein is normally expressed in the hair cells of the inner ear, as well as within the photoreceptors and the retinal pigment epithelium of the eye. So you can understand how defects in this gene would lead to problems with both hearing and vision. So in, um, in the hair cells of the inner ear, myosin 7A, as well as the other Usher's proteins, contribute very strongly to their development. So that's why if you have a problem in these proteins, the hair cells won't develop well, um, sometimes they never fully form, and that's why typically the patients lose hearing before vision. On the other hand, myosin 7A and a lot of the other um, Usher's proteins are not required for photoreceptor cell development, um, but rather they're required for their maintenance and their health after they're formed. We know that myosin 7A is expressed in a region of the photoreceptor that's involved in trafficking of proteins between the photoreceptor inner and outer segment. Um, an analogy I like to use um, for myself and for audiences like you is that you can think of the photoreceptor inner segment as a five lane highway. And then when you get into the connecting cilium, all of a sudden you're at one lane. And then you get back out into the outer segment and you're, five, you're at five lanes again. Um, so there's a lot of um, traffic men <laughs> in the one lane area that need to deal with the rush hour traffic. And photoreceptor cells have rush hour traffic all the time. They're the most highly metabolic cell in our entire body. So dealing with all of the cars that need to go from that five-lane highway to that one lane and get all the way into the outer segment is really a tough process. And so we know that myosin 7A is involved in that process. We also know that it's involved in um, melanosome migration. Um, just to describe that a little bit more deeply, um, in the RPE, which is the epithelial cell layer right above the photoreceptor cells, the RPE sends these finger-like projections down around the photoreceptor outer segments. And in those finger-like projections, there are pigmented melanosomes. And in uh, Usher's patients, it's known that those melanosomes will stick up into the RPE. And we're not completely sure what the purpose of that melanosome migration is, but we know that myosin 7A is involved in it. So if you don't have it, the melanosomes don't migrate, and it's likely that the healthy interaction between the RPE and the photoreceptors is damaged as a result. So fortunately for us, there is a mouse model of Usher's 1B. It's called the Shaker mouse. It carries mutations in myosin 7A, and as a result, it exhibits visual problems as well as vestibular abnormalities. And the visual problems it exhibits aren't on an ERG level. They're not on these large levels, but they do exhibit that um, defect in melanosome migration and the defect in the rush hour traffic um, situation. So what, what's been done with the shaker mouse is they've used a lentiviral vector um, to deliver myosin 7A to the subretinal space of the mouse and they found that this treatment restored both the melanosome migration phenotype as well as the protein transport phenotype. And I just want to linger for a second on the use of lentivirus. Lentivirus, um, compared to AAV, which you've heard a lot about um, during this conference, 
is a larger virus. Um, and myosin 7A is a relatively large gene. It's about 7,000 base pairs. So you need a larger virus to accommodate this large gene. It won't fit inside AAV. So that's the reason we use lentivirus. And all of this proof of concept data that we have for um, lentiviral treatment in the shaker mouse led to phase one clinical trials initiated by Oxford Biomedica, and their product is called USHSAT. Um, they are using, as I mentioned, a lentiviral vector, EIAV uh, specifically. And so far, um, from what I understand, there have been four patients treated at Oregon, and Paris is about to enroll patients. And again, a lot of these are in their very early stages, so there aren't published results, but so far everything um, seems to be safe. Okay, if I can turn my page here, we'll get to the next one. Okay, so the last one I'd like to talk about is autosomal recessive retinitis pigmentosa, specifically the form caused by mutations in MER-TK. So MER-TK is another protein that's expressed in the retinal pigment epithelium, again, the layer that's immediately adjacent to the photoreceptor cells. And to understand um, problems with um, autosomal recessive RP associated with MER-TK, we need to talk about the function of that protein as well. So MER-TK, again, is expressed in the RPE, and it's involved in a process that occurs basically every night when you go to sleep. Um, your photoreceptors work very hard during the day to take in the light and um, do all the biochemical things that they need to do in order for you to see. And when you lay down to go to bed at night, those photoreceptors are tired and they shed their outer segments. They've got these tips that they just shed. They get rid of them. They're tired. They're old. They don't need them anymore. And they regenerate things from uh, their inner segments. And the RPE's job is to collect that garbage, basically, and deal with it, digest it. And MER-TK is a protein that's involved in that digestion process. So if at night you shed these outer segments and you don't have MER-TK around to deal with that, digesting that garbage, more or less, then you're going to have this debris field that accumulates between the photoreceptors and the RPE. And when you get a debris field, when you get anything in the subretinal space, you're going to affect the healthy interaction between the RPE and the photoreceptors. And any time that interaction is disturbed, then you will compromise the function of the photoreceptor cells. So eventually they will lose function and they can degenerate. So that's what MER-TK does. Um, this is a very rare disease. It affects families primarily in the Middle East and the Faroe Islands. Fortunately for us, there is a very famous animal model associated with MER-TK RP, which is called the Royal College of Surgeons Rat, or the RCS Rat. And shockingly, this rat was first described in 1938, but it took until 2000 um, for researchers to determine that the reason this rat had a diseased retina was because of mutations in MER-TK. Shortly after 2000, when they identified the mutation in the rat, they went on to discover that this mutation occurred in patients with the disease. So there have been proof of concept studies involving multiple vector platforms in the RCS rat. When I say multiple, I'm referring to lentivirus, adenovirus, and AAV. The most successful long-term rescue, however, was achieved with a subretinal AAV-based vector. So with all of the proof of concept studies that we had um, built up, um, we initiated a clinical trial in Saudi Arabia. This was led by my uh, mentor, Bill Houseworth, and it involved a subretinal injection of AAV. Again, this is one of these trials that um, the results have not been published, but I can tell you that three patients have been treated, and reports are just verbally that everything was safe and anecdotally also effective. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. That, that was super. Um, tough act to follow. So that was a scientist, so that was quite highbrow. I'm going to bring it down a notch because I'm a clinician. Um, so I'd like to, I'm going to talk about choroideremia, Stargardt disease, and wet AMD. Uh, we'll kick off with choroideremia. So that's an X-linked retinal degeneration, so therefore affects males. And infrequently, carrier females can be severely affected, sometimes as severely affected as males. It's a childhood uh, teenage onset, typically, in the first instance with night blindness and subsequently with peripheral field loss, so side vision loss, which slowly progresses over time to affect central vision, reading vision, in the third to fifth decade of life. There are characteristic retinal findings uh, on examination in childhood and in carrier females, 
And later, there are very typical uh, thinning that's seen in uh, affecting both the choroid and the retina. The choroideremia gene produces a, a substance, a protein within retinal cells called RET1. And it's believed that this protein is important in transporting vital components within retinal cells. In the laboratory, it's been shown that replacement of RET1 using viral vector delivery systems has been shown to improve function in single cells and also in mouse models of choroideremia. Although there are significant limitations of, of these animal models, uh, including the fact that the knockout male mouse uh, is lethal. Moving to humans, in late 2011, uh, a human clinical trial of gene replacement uh, for choroideremia was initiated in the UK. It's going to be a 12 subject phase one to safety study using adeno associated virus to deliver REP1 under the retina with a single injection. It's a dose escalation study with two year follow up for all patients. And the sorts of patients that are being recruited are patients with fairly symmetrical disease and have to have vision of 2200 or better. So six subjects have been injected in the first instance. Um, and the way that the injection has been done, it's been aiming to detach the fovea, the central retina, uh, and that's been achieved in all six subjects. And the way that that's being done, uh, that's Professor McLaren in Oxford who's doing the surgeries, he's doing that in a two-step detachment process. So the first step is to actually detach the central retina using a, a salty solution uh, to make space, if you like, for the, the vector that's then injected, the viral vector delivering uh, the normal copy of the, of the gene in a 0.1 mil volume. And it's felt that this is a, a very controlled detachment. Uh, he uses a foot pump on the operating microscope. And the rationale being that this controlled detachment is less likely to cause any damage to the architecture of the retina at the time of the injection or, or shortly after. They've actually elected to take a six month pause um, after the sixth patient. Um, because of some concerns of retinal thinning, of uh, foveal thinning in the RP65 trials. There's, it's been a suggestion that detaching the fovea, the central retina, may actually be harmful to the structure of the retina. And because of that, they did take the six-month break. So all, all six patients have had at least six months uh, of follow-up now. All of them have regained their baseline vision, so none have reduced vision following the detachment and there's been no retinal thinning uh, observed to date. So using OCT uh, imaging to image the architecture of the retina, they've not observed any thinning at least out to six months. In terms of the way they're going to look to see if there's any uh, effectiveness, any efficacy, any, any benefit to the injections, they're looking at visual acuity, uh, they're looking at visual fields, they're looking at the OCT, and they're also looking at micro perimetry. So looking at very localized areas of retinal sensitivity. And they've suggested there's been some mild increases in sensitivity they've detected on using micro perimetry. So they're now proceeding to the next six patients and the first of the next uh, of this group of six patients has been injected. I understand there are at least two further future choroideremia uh, gene, trial, gene therapy trials planned. One is likely to be uh, by Gene Bennett and colleagues who've got funding to develop a choroideremia gene therapy trial. And the second is likely to be uh, by Ian McDonald's group in Canada who also have funding to develop a choroideremia trial. If we now go on to talk about uh, Stargardt disease, so it's the commonest form of childhood onset macular degeneration, and uh, so they're therefore a leading cause of blindness in childhood. It's uh, associated with recessive inheritance, and it's caused by faults in the ABCA4 gene. And we know a great deal about the function of this gene uh, and its role in recycling vitamin A in the retina, and we know how when faults in this uh, occur, that it results in abnormal function of the retinal cells and eventually of retinal cell death. There's a mouse model of Stargardt disease, and this has been really helpful in improving our understanding of the underlying disease process, and also useful in uh, demonstrating the potential effectiveness of gene replacement therapy. But it's not a brilliant model in that it doesn't recapitulate the human uh, disease, as, as Shannon's described 
So it has, the mouse model has a very later onset disease. It's a slower degeneration compared to uh, human beings. And also importantly, the mouse doesn't have a macula. It doesn't have a specialized retinal area for high contrast, uh, high, high visual acuity, whereas clearly the human does. Again, making the comparison between Stargardt disease and the forerunner for gene therapy, RP65. Um, the ABCA4 gene is a much larger gene. And so as Shannon suggested, uh, different viral vectors need to be used. And so the, again, a lentiviral vector is being used in the human trial to package the ABCA4 gene. There isn't a large animal model for Stargardt disease as there was for RP65. And also, for Stargardt disease, it's a, it's a short, or at least a shorter therapeutic window, a shorter window of opportunity compared to RP65. That being said, uh, STARGEN is the name of the gene replacement trial uh, funded by Oxford Biomedica and Sanofi, which is being conducted in two sites. That's happening in Portland, Oregon, and in Paris, France. They're undertaking perimacular subretinal injections. So they're not uh, aiming to detach the fovea. There are 14 patients at each site, uh, so that's 28 in total. It's a phase one, two. Again, safety is the primary endpoint. And that began in June of 2011. And there are three groups of patients that are being rec uh, recruited to the, this study. They're all adult patients. They all have abnormal full-field ERG, so that means uh, when one checks the electrical activity of the retina, they have a generalized retinal involvement. The entire retina is affected. So the first group is the most severely affected, so they have a severe cone rod dystrophy, so they have a severe generalized involvement of the retina, and they have vision worse than 2200. The second group of patients will have a milder generalized retinal involvement, but again, vision less than 2200. And the third group of patients will have a cone dystrophy, so lack any rod involvement. And their vision will be better at the level of 2100. It's a dose escalation study. And to date, uh, eight patients have been uh, injected with the low dose. That was four patients with a severe generalized retinal involvement and four with a milder generalized retinal involvement. And there have been four patients that have received an intermediate dose, and again, patients with a milder generalized retinal involvement. The highest dose uh, is underway, and there'll be 16 patients who will receive the highest dose. I understand the trial is just currently paused because of some issues relating to vector manufacturing. There's otherwise, I'm not aware of any safety concerns to date. In terms of looking at the effectiveness, the efficacy, um, they're looking at visual acuity. They're looking incredibly closely at uh, visual field, retinal sensitivity, using um, very sophisticated technology that Professor Weller has de uh, developed. They're looking at the architecture of the retina with OCT. They're using autofluorescence imaging and also adaptive optics imaging to look directly at the cone photoreceptors themselves. So finally, I'd, I'd like to touch on wet uh, age-related macular degeneration. So that's the leading cause of blindness in the developed world. Vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, uh, is the major player in the abnormal new vessel uh, formation in the retina, which is the hallmark of wet AMD. We have multiple drug, drugs available now which have revolutionized our management of wet AMD. And these include Avastin, also known as Bevzizumab, Lucentis, also known as Ranibizumab, and Ilea, also known as Aflibacet. And these are all very effective. Uh, they stabilize vision in approximately 90% of patients, and they can improve vision in approximately 30 to 40% of patients. However, they, repeat, they require repeated long-term injections um, at great cost, uh, both financial in terms of time, and that's a cost both to the patient and to the healthcare system. There's also a cumulative risk of side effects from these injections into the eyeball, albeit very small. So the aim of gene therapy approaches is to, with a single treatment, to result in a sustained production of similar agents that can block new vessel growth and formation. So without the need for regular injections to the eye. And the rationale is to use ret the retinal cells themselves to produce the therapeutic drug. 
So one approach that's being followed is to use a viral vector delivery system with a single ocular injection to result in a sustained production over time of a binder of VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, and that's called soluble FLIT1. And this mops up VEGF and thereby prevents its harmful effects. It's been shown to be effective in, in ser several animal models of new vessel formation using intravitreal delivery, so an injection into the center of the eyeball, as well as subretinal, so injection underneath the retina itself. And intravitreal delivery, which is the way that we give the aforementioned drugs of Avastin, Lucentis, and Ilea, um, is far safer and potentially could be an office-based procedure. Personally, I find it difficult to envisage that we'll be doing subretinal injections um, for such a very common condition. I'm not sure that's going to be feasible. So Genzyme Sanofi has initiated a phase one clinical trial using a viral vector delivery uh, given by intravitreal injection to determine the safety and effectiveness of soluble FLIT1 in controlling new vessel formation in wet AMD. That's a, a dose escalation study. They're going to be looking at four doses. There'll be approximately 34 patients. They'll be, uh, to be eligible for that trial, the study I will need to have a vision worse than 2100. I'm, I'm not aware of any safety concerns to date and it would appear that the study aims to be completed by November 2017. There's a similar study looking at uh, soluble FLIT1, a safety efficacy study, uh, being done at the Lions Eye Institute in Perth in Western Australia. And I understand there'll be 48 patients in that study. Uh, patients will have to be 55 years or over with wet AMD. And the patients are being randomized to receive one of two doses or uh, assigned to a control group. And that appears to be planned to complete in December 2014. There are multiple other inhibitors of new vessel growth that are being explored using viral vectors. And the other one is the Oxford Biomedica Sanofi um, study uh, th that has commenced. It's a phase one study. It's called Retinostat, uh, investigating the safety of combined delivery of endostatin and angiostatin to the eye. So these are both inhibitors of uh, new vessel growth and act via different mechanisms. And that study's happening uh, in Portland and in Baltimore. And that's recruiting patients with advanced wet AMD. They receive a single subretinal injection. There'll be approximately 18 patients in total recruited to that study. There have been eight patients that have been involved during the dose escalation phase. And those were patients who had to have vision of less than 2200 with very advanced disease. They had subretinal fibrosis, they had severe scarring. That dose escalation has been completed, and they've now established the, the maximum tolerated dose. And so subsequent patients are now receiving that maximum dose, and those patients need to have vision of 20, 80 or worse. Now, because these proteins are actually secreted and, and uh, soluble within the eye, it's been possible by removing small amounts of fluid from the eye to determine the levels of the protein and it's been able to determine that the levels in the protein are related to the dose of the subretinal injection. There's been a suggestion of potentially some early effectiveness using OCT, so architectural evidence of uh, benefit. Again, the trial has been paused. As a, a final comment, and I know it's been mentioned in several other sessions, uh, one can get relatively reliable information on, on clinical trials happening around the world on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, that's provided by the NIH. Many thanks for your attention. Hi, so I didn't, I didn't prepare anything since I just got roped into this session, but we are participating in, in four out of the six trials mentioned, so I can answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll spend the next 15 minutes or so taking questions from the audience. Because we're recording the session, please wait until a microphone runner reaches you so that you may ask your question into the microphone. We'll try to ensure we can get as many questions as possible within the time frame, but we ask that you do one question at a time um, in order to allow everybody to go. So we have our first question back here with Dan. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you for the presentation. Definitely exciting, encouraging information today. Uh, my question is, I know there's some upcoming trials with Genable, and I'm trying to recall, these. I know these involve uh, autosomal dominance, specifically, I think, the uh, Rhodopsin gene. But I'm trying to recall, and, and hopefully you can clarify for me, is this, uh, is there, does their approach involve knocking out the bad gene, or are they using an approach that, with a philosophy that if you put enough of the good gene in, you can still uh, salvage vision? Uh, even without a somal dominant or dominant forms. So Dan, that is a knockdown and an add-in, both, whereas Al Lewin and Bill Houseworth and that group is looking at augmenting in a different mutation in the rhodopsin gene, but the genable is a knockdown add back. I'm sorry if I missed this. Did you say anything about studies for recessive-related uh, RP? We talked specifically. We talked specifically about the MERTK form of autosomal recessive RP. Did you need me to elaborate? Uh, well, because that that seemed to focus on specific to people who are affected out in Asia, air, Asian area or Middle East. But yeah. I wasn't sure if that was the same as when they say you have. Um, you know, inherited RP uh, that's just like spontaneous or recessive. No, this would be specific to the MERTK yeah, form okay. of the disease. Oh, I was wondering. Okay, thank you. No problem. Questions? Everybody looking forward to reception? <laughs> <laughs> we have one more coming up here. Hi, I'm a little confused. I went to iGene, and I'm negative for the nine genes that they tested. Um, I didn't go to iGene, I live in California. But then I went to the um, uh, vendors, and then Oregon Health Science has, they said they have like 65 genes, and it costs, you know, $1,500 or 50 genes or whatever. So now I don't know if iGene's gonna, if they know of the other 50 or 40, are they gonna test me? And then if I'm negative for all of those, am I, does that mean I'm phenotyped or genotyped or whatever it's called? And am I a candidate later on for a trial? I'm confused. <laughs> maybe, maybe I can answer some of that. So I'm, I'm presuming you have RP, is that correct? Okay, so I think it's important to realize that there are, there are different kinds of genetic testing. There is commercial genetic testing where you go to a, a company there is research genetic testing, which is often done at a you know, university setting. Um, and iGene is, is a special program that is funded through the NIH. And one of the great things about iGene is that it does not cost the patient anything. And, and that's, you know, for many reasons, insurance companies often will not cover genetic testing. And so for many of our patients, that, that is the only option that's available. At this time, when we think about RP, we know there are probably upwards of 100 genes that can cause RP, and we haven't even discovered all of them yet. So even if we could test for all 100 that we know about, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be able to find everything because there's some that have yet to be discovered. Now that being said, you know, iGene is testing a, a small number of genes. They're not testing a, a hundred, and that may change in the future as, as their technology changes. Some of the commercial vendors can test a larger number of genes, but you're going to have to pay for that. And sometimes insurance will cover it, sometimes insurance will not, and you have to pay out of pocket. The good news about genetic testing is that every year it gets better and it gets cheaper. So I think when you look back five years ago, the number of genes that you would get for $2,000, you know, might have been five or 10. Now we're up to 60, and in a year it might be 100. And so it just keeps getting better. So if you can't afford it now, wait a little while, it's gonna get cheaper. Did that answer your question? If you're negative, can you be in a clinical trial? Or how, I, I guess I don't understand that part of it. Okay, so it depends on the clinical trial. Some clinical trials, like the MER-TK trial that, that Shannon talked about, 
require you to have a mutation in that particular gene. You were tested for nine genes, probably the most common gene, and they didn't find something, which means you probably have one of the other 91 genes that weren't tested for. Some trials are specific where they need you to have a certain genotype. For example, the valproic acid trial is only looking at patients who have autosomal dominant RP. Other trials, though, in the future may not require you to necessarily have a genotype. If you look at the, the CNTF trial, it was more you have to have RP. It, it didn't matter which mutation it was from. So it's going to depend on the trial. For a gene therapy trial that is a gene replacement specific, then you have to know the gene. But for drug trials, you may not need to know. For overarching gene therapy, which might be something like putting in a neuroprotective, not a specific gene, or even optogenetics, which is something we haven't talked about because it's not in the clinic, which is where you're putting in a light sensing molecule for individuals, it, call it the biological chip. You're looking to restore vision by hijacking a light sensitive molecule from an algae or a bacteria. That's not necessarily going to have to know the gene that's involved. So it depends. For gene therapy, for a specific genetic mutation, you've got to know the gene. Uh, you kind of answered my question there, Steve. I was just, you know, it's great to hear the update from what's going on at the moment, but I'm talking about maybe gene therapy to benefit more people. When is that, when do you envisage that maybe moving once the proof of principle is shown for individual genes? How far are we for more generalized gene therapy? Steve mentioned uh, gene replacement therapy, so when you're addressing single gene diseases and you need to put in a specific sequence of the gene to make that patient healthy, um, I wouldn't refer to that as generalized gene therapy. I think, you know, there's going to be safety studies, um, toxicity studies, and FDA approval required for each individual gene therapy that we um, come up with um, for gene replacement, but as he mentioned, um, in terms of more generalized gene therapy, when you're considering adding a neuroprotective agent whose role is just to keep the photoreceptor cells healthier so that you can see longer, that is something you could refer to as more generalized gene therapy. In terms of when something like that will be available, Steve? <laughs> that, that's a unknown at this moment. Uh, in optogenetics, there's a lot of work ongoing with multiple companies and multiple researchers, and there are some that are closer to clinic if they can get over certain hurdles. It could be a year, two years, three years for something like that. Um, Dr. Sahel in Paris with his one of his optogenetics approaches um, in talking with him said, they're looking at about two, two and a half, three years to be in the clinic with that. They've shown proof of concept, proof of, prin proof of principle in the animal models. Um, for a neuroprotective, um, at this moment, there's a lot of exploratory work ongoing as to what you would use. The, the issue is if you look at CNTF, which was put in in the Neurotech trial, um, that actually is almost a form of gene therapy and that you genetically modified the cells that you put in a capsule that you put in the eye. It's all kind of come down to dosing and understanding what's happening. So the closest that we're aware of, it would be the optogenetic of Dr. Sahel within two, two and a half years, according to him. Maria, you've got a question over here. First, we'll come back over here. Behind you, Jim. Hi, um, perfect segue. I have two questions, but the first was prompted by what you just mentioned. Um, I was in the CNTF trial, and there really has not m been much discussion or information um, in quite a while, so I was wondering if there was any update or anything happening there. And then the second, this is directed more to the panelists, since um, I I've, I've, um, have talked to you, Dr. Rose. I, my gene was diagnosed uh, relatively recently. 
KLRH, I believe, is, is what it is. And I just wondered if you have any suggestions as to how I can approach seeing if I can get some interest um, inspired to look into it. So for CNTF, um, there's an ongoing follow-up study with Dr. Jackie Duncan on individuals who have received the CNTF like you did, DeVita. It's looking at preservation of cones through adaptive, a non-invasive imaging technique um, that she's published on to see if, in fact, uh, that has been sustained. What Dr. Duncan found was that 35 to 40 percent more cones were preserved in the eyes that received the CNTF capsule low dose um, versus those that did not receive CNTF. The issue is, are those cones actually functional, visually functional? I also know that the uh, National Institutes of Health, National Eye Institute, Dr. Paul Seving is looking at CNTF and achromatopsia at the moment, but I have no other information on that particular trial. You brought up a very interesting question and one that the foundation faces all the time, which is as more genes are defined and discovered as well as individuals who get a genetic diagnosis, um, it's always the question, what about me? What about my gene? Um, there are certain one uh, genes that are being moved forward. Certainly groups are looking at what are the distinct possibilities of moving each gene forward. Uh, part of the issue there is capacity, but even more, what is the function of that gene and whether the theory and the experimental data is such that that gene would be what you, uh, what I call gene therapyable, excuse the horrible English, but not every gene, and I'm not saying yours is the case here, but not every gene could be treated by gene therapy just because of the mechanism of what that gene is actually doing. So it really comes down to capacity. Uh, you already heard from Mark, there are over 100 RP gene, RP, RDD genes that have been identified. Um, there just isn't enough capacity to do 100 gene therapies throughout the world in retinal degeneration. So the issue becomes how can we address this and something the foundation is looking at very, very intensely to deal with more generalized therapy that would have an effect for everybody rather than having to do single gene therapies for every gene that is found. Um, there were some questions here in the back on the right. I know Dan has again. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I know that we are funding some research to look into the potential of using nanotechnology as a delivery system for gene therapy. I wonder if you've got some perspectives on the state of that research. Um, well, um, as I discussed in Gene Therapy 101, each vector platform is very unique in its characteristics. I, I gave the analogy of the taxi cab, and Luke extended it to um, suggest that certain taxi cabs can go faster, certain ta taxi cabs can um, deliver the, the passenger and the passenger will stay around for a long time. Um, it's kind of a silly analogy, but um, I, I think that when considering nanoparticles versus, for instance, AAV, some really hard studies need to be done to compare the efficacy of a nanoparticle versus an AAV for delivering a gene. Um, you need to look at persistence of transgene expression. That's a huge thing. You know, I talked about Lance a lot. He had therapeutic effects over the course of his life. Is that achievable with a nanoparticle? That needs to get looked at. They need to be compared side by side. And the foundation is funding those studies. Yep. More questions? Everybody is looking for the reception. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming.
for attending the session. There will be a cocktail reception starting at 6.30 in the Grand Ballroom foyer right outside, followed by the awards dinner and dance at 7.30 in the Grand Ballroom. It'll be here. This is one through five. They're going to add six. Don't forget to collect your stickers of at least 10 exhibitors and turn it into the exhibit hall raffle card re registration desk. Prize winners will be announced at the awards dinner. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it and look forward to seeing you tonight at the dinner.